<laughs> when I, see her in there, I always stand in front of my bookshelf. <laughs> Oh, that's really yeah. With insanely bright lights on and yeah. you know, cameras rolling around. <laughs> oh, that looks great, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Scott Geraci. Um, I live here in Levy Park in Tallahassee. I've lived in this space for seven years. Um, I've lived, I moved to Florida in late 89, grew up on Long Island. Um, a family of six, I had three brothers, but. Um, Art and creativity has kind of always been in the family, um, on both sides of my parents' family. And um, yeah. well, this is kind of where I live and make art. So. I draw on wood mostly. I do draw on paper sometimes, but I like drawing on wood because it's 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 different, and I like the um, I like the texture of the wood. I like the way my pen sounds on the wood more than on paper. Um, I know there's like an interaction between the pen and the wood and me. Um, so um, yeah, and then even my work at FSU. Um, you know, I did um, a lot of sculpture installations, especially in my last semester, and I used clay, but I, I used unfired clay, which is not like, it's not that I'm the first person to ever use unfired clay, but um, I like the idea of, you know, covering um, objects in unfired clay and mixing other things within. Um, so I, I try not to, I try to use things in unexpected ways. When I'm drawing, it's definitely a meditative process and I do kind of disappear into whatever I'm doing. Um, and I know for me, um, it is definitely a way of calming anxieties, fear, insecurity, noise in my head. Um, the, the past, you know, year 2020, I mean, it's 2020, we all know what 2020 was. Um, and it's, it, it, it was a difficult year for me personally, just on, you know, very, on several different personal levels. Um, living during a pandemic, you know, living alone, seeing the end of a major relationship. But, um, at drawing, I mean, making art, I, without it, I'd probably be a bigger mess than I am. Um, probably be a lot less sane. And, and frankly, sometimes, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not the only artist or human to deal with depression. And I'm, I'm certain that at times, um, in the last two years, art has saved my life. I mean, For a long time, um, I would let the rain wash the mural, the window murals away, um, which I, um, which I really enjoy. Like I, some people um, have said to me, I can't believe you just let the rain wash it away. And actually, it's something my neighbor said, Why don't you do it on the inside of your window? And well, logistically, there's a um, bookshelf right there. So and plus. Being on the inside drawing, then that puts me in this like weird space of being on display and it feels, I don't know, just that, that thought never crossed my mind. But being outside, you know, a lot of times I'll, you know, in the spring when I'm doing it, I'll be out there till one o'clock in the morning um, with my window backlit and it's just, you know, it's really, um, and it's meditative too, now that I think about it. <laughs> um, I say I don't meditate, but I guess I do, through my art, which I had not thought about, but um, I do, I just kind of get lost in it, and it's, 
nice to share it, but um, what I've done with the last couple of window murals is I've started to now, instead of waiting for the weather to take them, I intentionally erase them and I make a, um, I make it, make it a part of the process, but I don't just, you know, um, and I like that it's, um, what's that word I'm looking for besides temporary? Not, I mean, even fleeting, but that's not the word I'm looking for, but, but it's directly influenced by, um, the Tibetan monks. Um, for years, the, the Tibetan monks would come to Tallahassee and create their beautiful sand mandalas um, in the art building. And, and I, I mean, I've loved watching the process. And then I just absolutely love that when they're done, they take a broom, they sweep it up, they go out to a body of water, and they let the sand go. And there's just something incredibly beautiful and, um, I don't know, simple and poetic about it. It was right around the time I started drawing again, and um, right around when I turned 50. And when I, when I turned 50, I, I thought to myself, okay, you know, this is a good time to really push the art and try to do something with it. I figure, you know, I might get a good 30, 40 years um, of making art, and I wanted to do something. So when I first started drawing again, I started small. I was doing bookmarks. and lots of them and um, and not really doing anything with them, but I started leaving them places um, for people to find. I left bookmarks in Jacksonville, Miami, Atlanta, Dallas, and Albuquerque. And most of them, I don't know what happened to them, um, but I encourage people, if they find them, to either keep it for themselves or take it on, take it with them on their next stop. And I kind of gave it a hashtag of bookmark journeys. But um, so I left a bookmark, I uh, left several bookmarks in Dallas. And when I came back to Tallahassee, um, I was actually working. And I remember where I was. I was actually, I was doing um, like DoorDash or Uber Eats, I can't remember which. But I was on Gain Street, right around Railroad Square. And I actually had to pull over because I got a message on Instagram from a gentleman who said, hey, I found one of your bookmarks that you left at the airport. Um, and this was um, all the video chat. I'm like, oh, cool. Like, where did you find it? And he said, Seattle. And I was just shocked. He found it six days later. Um, and what was interesting is he's a firefighter in Seattle. And apparently, at the time, he was... Um, he was having a rough go, you know, like a lot of us sometimes do. And he decided to um, book a trip to Cancun. He needed to get away and kind of recenter. And when he got to Seattle, he found my bookmark. He found my bookmark at the gate. And it apparently had such a profound effect on him. And I don't know why, because, you, know, you know, it was one of my typical drawings of um, these vines growing out of this mass uh, in the middle. And, you know, it's kind of, they're kind of surreal and they're kind of abstract, but they're based in something that you, people can recognize. But he had a really profound, um, it had a really profound effect on him. So he took it with him and left it in Cancun in a hotel room there, which I thought was wonderful. And, um, but when he came back, he messaged me and asked if he could get it tattooed on his calf, which, you know, completely just blew me away. And I said yes. So I, I, like, I like that um, I like making art. I like making it for myself, but then just like giving it away and letting it go.
So um, after I left FSU, um, I went to work at um, Pyramid Studios, which is a nonprofit that um, is a, basically a day center for adults with disabilities. And I worked as an art teacher. Um, I taught painting, um, although I'm not a painter. But, um, and it really, I mean, it, it was just one of the best things I think I've done as far as jobs go. Um, and I feel like it was something that I was particularly good at and successful, but um, it was deeply inspiring because, um, you know, so many people have the urge to make art and create. And, you know, some, some of us are not always as physically able to, but that doesn't diminish um, the drive to make art. And um, that is something I learned. Um, I think a lot of times people, you know, we judge books by the cover, their cover, and you, you know, there's that, that's a community that people don't quite um, always take seriously and um, maybe don't um, see them as true artists, but there were so many people, um, so many of my students at Pyramid who are just, you know, heart and soul artists who create art for the same reason that I do, because they need to, they want to, they have to express some, themselves. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was a gift to be able to work there. I loved it, I loved my students. Um, I mean, and it, you know, I think it teaches you hum humility and, um, and, and really, I mean, I learned as much from them as they did from me, I mean, so. And, and I'm fortunate that I have um, here, I have um, a few pieces on my wall from one of my favorite, favorite students who, sorry, he passed, um, he passed away a couple of years ago, but, um, one of my favorite, one of my favorite humans like I've ever met, William was a, uh, he was a handful, big guy, probably at least four inches taller than me, probably a hundred pounds heavier, had a bit of a temper, but down in the heart of it, he was a big teddy bear, and he was sweet, um, but, you know, um, maybe misunderstood, but um, he created these beautiful um, characters, and um, I'm fortunate that when he passed, someone, um, my former boss, asked me if I wanted his paintings, and so I have four paintings here that he created in my classroom, like I got to witness him make them, and it was such a joy, and um, he was just fun. I mean, you know, he could be temperamental and he could be gruff and whatnot, but um, some of my best times at Pyramid were with William because, you know, he, I don't know, he was, um, I think about it, he was, you know, he accepted me for who I was and vice versa and you know, we were friends. Like I, I, I think of William as my friend. So um, I'm super grateful that you know, every day he's kind of you know looking down on me, and that I can um, remember him giving me a hard time about having a turkey sandwich every day. You should try something different. He would always give me grief about my um, key lime yogurt and my turkey sandwich, so, yeah, but anyway. So yeah, I have, um, I, I have six kids, and um, I guess that is considered a big family, but I never really, I don't know, I never really thought of it that way. Um, you know, at the time, there, um, at the time, it, you know, it just seemed 
normal to me, but um, you know, clearly six is an unusual number, and it's a pretty big number. Um, um, I'm no longer I'm, I'm divorced, so um, but you know, when all six kids and mom and dad were out and about, that was always quite um, fun just to see people's reactions and. Um, you know, it's, um, but yeah, I guess it is a big family, but it, I don't know, it didn't, never felt like it was big or never felt like it was too much. Um, I think we just kind of, um, I think Maggie, my, the um, mother of my children and I, we just kind of grew into it. It just, <laughs> it was, it was what our life was. So it, it um, Surprisingly, it never, it, it very rarely felt daunting or like too much. Um, and there were, um, you know, there's a big gap between um, number two and number three. Um, there's like a seven year gap. So um, they're almost like two separate little families. Um, but then the, the last four are all pretty much grouped together. But um, but from one to six, I mean, you know, as a parent, I think as a parent, as any parent with multiple kids, once the number starts going up, you become a lot more relaxed. In photography, I always try to find what I call hidden beauty, like. It's so funny the things that make me emotional. But like, again, broken things, rusted things, things that are decaying. I try to find the beauty in those things and present them so people see them in a different light. And that's so very much probably what I'm trying to do with, you know, my art is like present myself. Because, you know, everybody's a little broken. And so it just occurred to me that how much of my work is, you know, like trying to um, present myself, you know, this broken, you know, you know, I'm, you know, nobody's perfect and we all have flaws, but, you know, trying to present myself as something that people can see me in a different way and, and people probably don't see myself, see me in the way I see myself, but um, but the thing I loved about the vines is that like even in the like the the death of something, because this one piece was very personal and, and it had to do with the death of a relationship, but but I loved with the vines growing up these entrails and the vines growing up this swing that's been long forgotten in the wagons. Like it's kind of a reclaiming and then you know, even in the death of things, like, there's still beauty because new things grow from it. So, um, yeah. what is really interesting to me is that so many people see biological elements to it. Synapses and nerves. I have a piece that, um, that was at the Gadsden Art Center a couple of years ago and a friend of mine bought it. And she's a professor at, uh, um, at, F at FSU teaching, um, psychology and neuroscience. And it's, a, it's one of my trees that has these roots that are underneath and they're, um, the tree is just kind of floating in space. And um, anyway, she works in, like I said, um, neuroscience and she gets tons of visitors from the neuroscience community. And that tree has been now nicknamed the neuron tree, which, you know, it's just, it's interesting that your work can start at one thing and then it takes on a new life and, and it's just intriguing to me that people see different things in it and, you know, things that I don't. Um, I think 3D Foundations was one of my first classes I had to take. And um, my professor, Johnny, who was an MFA student, which was kind of fun to be older than my um, professor, but she's an awesome teacher. Um, we assigned a um, found object sculpture, which 
I was super excited about, and um, um, immediately I knew I was going to create this piece. Um, like 16 years prior, I had doodled in a drawing book a picture of a little boy pulling a wagon stacked with boxes and like very precarious, like any moment they could fall over and onto him. So I knew I was going to create that piece, um, just knew. I was like, this is the moment. Um, so I went to Goodwill and um, various places um, and bought things that reminded me of my childhood so I could create this piece. And I found um, it's a good sense store, um, Ernie from Sesame Street, an Ernie doll. Everybody knows Sesame Street. The, the interesting thing for me, and I'll, I've talked to other people about this, and they don't, not everyone shares my opinion, but I've always related to Ernie from Sesame Street. I don't know why. I've always felt connected to him. And um, to me, there's always been, at least in my the way I interact with Ernie from Sesame Street, I always saw a sadness in him. And um, I think as a kid, I don't think as a kid I consciously was aware. I mean, obviously this is later in life that I realized it, but when I see Ernie, there's like a melancholy about him. And I just felt this like kinship to him, like, like you know, I see myself and Ernie, and it's kind of nice to see, you know, this, you know, because Ernie was always kind of a little bit of, a little bit of mischief, mis, mischievous, how do you say that word? Mischievous. Mischievous. Ernie was always a little mischievous, I thought. But there was also, like, he always had this little twinkle in his eye, but, but there was this, always this, like, touch of sadness about him, and I don't know, I don't know what that's all about, and could be me reflecting, but so I just feel this, um, I don't know, this like kinship with Ernie, like, hey, I see you, Ernie, I know you're sad, I'm sad too, and um, so Ernie has been um, in a couple different pieces, and he's somewhere in my studio, um, covered in clay, because the last, um, I think the last time I used him, I covered him in clay, but I'm really fond of, um, sorry, losing my track of thought. That's fine. It's okay. Um, anxieties. Okay, so um, definitely, um, I haven't quite determined exactly what all my drawings mean, um, whether they're, the water pieces are directly influenced um, by my drowning experience and um, I knew immediately, I mean, like, you know, once I recovered, um, I knew immediately that I would some, at some point do a water, I would have to do a water piece, that um, there was really no way to escape it. But at some point during my creative process, um, I would have to address it, because it was a pretty traumatic experience, and, um, you know, it, there was... It's a matter of, you know, probably 30 seconds that um, I easily would not be here. I mean, so, um, and it, what's interesting is when I created the first water piece, it wasn't like, oh, let's do this water piece. I um, actually picked up a piece of wood and I was going to do my typical, I was going to do my usual pen and ink drawings. And, um, I picked up this piece of wood and suddenly saw water. And I'm gonna get emotional. Okay. Um, and I knew, like, in that moment, it was like, oh, it's time. It's time to to address this thing. Um, because, you know, even though I survived, um, there's still a little, like, I mean, even now, it's been almost eight years, it's still a uh, there's still that little bit of, you know, I could not be here. So, um, 
When I saw that wood, I knew. And that first piece was definitely, um, definitely a way to cope with some of those feelings. It's pretty dark. I mean, you can tell it's water, but there is something underneath the water. There's this darkness. But it's interesting that through the process, um, they have become much more calmer. And I love, I do love like creating, I love that I'm creating, you know, elements like water out of wood. Like there's something to me that's um, kind of poetic about taking, um, I don't know why this is making me emotional, but um, taking something like hard and physical, like a piece of wood, and transforming it so that someone looks at it and they're, they're you know, automatically looking at a beach or even invoking this feeling of being at a beach. Um, and it's calm and peaceful. And it's funny that I've not actually, I'm just literally processing this now, how um, Sorry, and you, you okay. don't need to cut, you know, it's me okay. just being emotional. Um, I'm just really, like, literally in this moment, moment processing how th all those the pieces since that first one have this calming effect and that it's, you know, this subconscious way of, um, you know, trying to calm that fear. And um, not that I'm going to go drown again. Um, or anything like that, but I think it's, you know, maybe even, um, like those water pieces um, are like a reminder to me, like, you're still here. So it's interesting. That question, one of the questions you had written um, is, what is a successful artist? I don't know if I think about that a whole lot. Um, say, say the question one more time. Sure. Um, so what do you want to leave behind? And what does legacy mean to you? I'm just thinking of how I want to. Good thing we're not live. We speak a lot of dead air right <laughs> this now. This is great. Right? No, it's so like when I was in high school and I worked at my high school radio station and they would always freak out. <laughs> dead air! Dead air. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, making art, um, trying to think of like what my goal is as far as what I want to leave behind. I mean, I don't, I, I don't think I'll, I mean, I don't expect that I'm going to be an artist that, um, you know, is going to be in um, museums across the world, and that's fine. Um, I, don't really, I don't know if I, I don't know if I really think about, like, legacy and what um, I want to leave behind. I mean, I mean, it's kind of nice to know that the art will exist long after I do, I mean, assuming, you know, like, I mean, one of my recent commissions is going to Ireland, and I love that, you know, hopefully, you know, the woman who bought it at some point will pass it on to someone, because she's not going to be here forever either, so in that aspect, that is kind of a lovely legacy, like, to think that, you know, in 150 years, somewhere, there's going to be something hanging with my name on it. And it doesn't really matter to me that, you know, it's not going to, it's not necessarily going to be in a gallery or an art museum. Um, I mean, so I suppose if, um, you know, people who have bought my work, if they, um, if they treasure it enough that they pass it on to someone, that would be a pretty cool legacy. Um, 
I mean, I guess we all want to be remembered in some way. So, I mean, I guess it's nice that um, in some aspects, the art is like this physical reminder of it. Hey, Scott Dracy existed. And that's kind of cool and kind of nice to think about like years down the line. And you know, hopefully they, they uh, people who know me or whatever, or you know, think of um, think of me fondly as that uh, the furry guy who drew on his window and walls. I don't know.